you all here. Yes, thanks, Emily, for starting the recording. Uh, Christina, if you can share, uh, share and encourage. Uh, so everyone, please enter your questions in the chat uh, in the Google Doc that Christina has shared. And now we'll start with the paper, uh, with the second set of papers. So the first paper uh, is titled Going Down the Rabbit Hole, Characterizing the Long Tail of Wikipedia Reading Sessions. And the authors are Tiziano Picardi, Martin Gilrick, and Robert West. Okay, uh, can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see you, we can hear you, Tiziano. Okay, perfect. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to present you a characterization of uh, Wikipedia uh, rabbit, rabbit hole behavior. I'm Tiziano Piccardi, a PhD student at EPFL, and this work uh, is a result of the collaboration with uh, Martin Garlack uh, of the Wikimedia Foundation and my advisor, Bob West. So imagine you are uh, you hear about a TV series called The Last Kingdom. You check uh, on uh, Wikipedia, what is it about? And you see that uh, it's about Alfred the Great. So you are curious to start uh, uh, and you start to follow the links, uh, discovering that he fought the Vikings. Uh, the Vikings uh, that uh, created Vinland, a settlement in North America, and uh, where they used to make wine from berries. And so on, uh, going to fermentation, Neolithic, uh, ancient Egypt, it, you end up uh, reading about polytheism and the role of pharaohs. What just happened is called uh, uh, falling in a wiki rabbit hole, uh, being dragged by Wikipedia in a long session where you get lost and learn uh, about a diverse set of topics. The name is of, co of course a reference to the novel Alice in um, uh, Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, this is a behavior uh, uh, well known in popular culture uh, but uh, uh, what we know is uh, based only on uh, anecdotal reports. Uh, in this study, we characterize uh, these uh, wiki rabbit holes in a data-driven way by investigating the digital traces left on the server by the readers. To support our analysis, we collected one month of server logs uh, of the entire Wikipedia in English. In total, we collected more than 6.5 billion uh, page load events that we carefully uh, anonymized. And uh, thanks to the HTTP uh, referral field, we transformed these logs into navigation, uh, uh, navigation session uh, that connect sequential click of, of the same user. But how do we recognize uh, uh, rabbit holes uh, session? Um, there are multiple possibilities, uh, uh, but uh, in our analysis, uh, we consider as a fall into a rabbit hole when the depth of the session is at least 10 articles. By applying this rule, uh, we retain around 0.24% of all the original sessions. And as the title of the paper suggests, uh, we are exploring uh, the long tail of the navigation sessions. Let's see how, uh, let's see now some of the um, uh, properties of these uh, uh, long sessions. First, by looking at the most common uh, entry pages, uh, we notice that often people start uh, long uh, explorations from articles about election, television shows, uh, and historical dynasties. All these uh, articles have one thing in common. The info box has uh, uh, navigational links, uh, such as predecessor or successor, that are used uh, by readers to explore uh, all the articles of uh, a series. A second interesting property is that uh, when we look at the temporal dynamics, uh, we notice differences between day and night. In this plot, uh, we have the fraction of uh, rabbit hole session by time of the day divided by device and uh, weekday and weekend. Uh, we notice that the fraction of rabbit hole uh, sessions is higher during the night with an increase of almost two times from mobile. But what topics are associated with uh, rabbit hole sessions? Uh, to answer this question, we use regression analysis. First, uh, we assign to the first article of, uh, the, of the first article of the session, the topic vector obtained from ORES, the official uh, um, Wikipedia topic classifier. And then we assign the positive label to session with at least a depth of 10 articles and the negative one uh, to uh, all the others. Then by fitting a logistic regression, 
we uh, obtained the topics that are uh, mostly associated with falling in, um, in a wiki rabbit hole. The coefficient show uh, that the topics, uh, the topics like such as libraries, uh, history, and entertainment uh, lead readers uh, um, uh, to longer sessions, while articles about uh, STEM and medicine are more associated with brief interaction with Wikipedia. Finally, the next natural question is uh, how do uh, these sessions evolve uh, beyond uh, the first page? For example, do people uh, move semantically far from the first article when they navigate the content? Uh, to answer this question, uh, first we projected all articles uh, in uh, a topic space uh, obtained from ORES. We basically use uh, the topic vector as uh, the article position in this space. And then for each article, uh, starting a session, uh, like a great triangle in, uh, in this case, we look at the evolution of the trajectory in this space. To have an AL model to compare with the uh, human navigation, uh, we uh, created a random worker that navigates Wikipedia by picking a random link available on the page. And for each trajectory, we run the random work starting from the same document and for the same number of steps. And finally, we computed the uh, mean uh, square displacement that is used in physics uh, to measure the dispersion of particles from the starting position. It is basically the um, average of the square distances. With this metric, we can uh, uh, plot the diffusion uh, of the random trajectory in the semantic space. Each line uh, is in this plot is the average of the displacement of the trajectories uh, of uh, a given length. When we add the human uh, generated trajectories, uh, we observe an important property. They don't converge to a random location. Um, this is uh, important because it means that the readers stay in the semantic neighborhood of the first page, um, even for lo long session. So on, on average, uh, in a wiki rabbit hole, uh, readers get lost, but in a set of consistent topics. So in conclusion, um, we learned that uh, Wikipedia, um, wiki rabbit hole sessions are uh, affected by the structure of the page, uh, are more frequent at night. Uh, they start uh, more frequently from articles about entertainment. And on average, they don't lead the readers to a complete random page. Thank you for attention. I'm happy to answer your question. Awesome. That's time for one question. Yeah. Thank you, Tiziana. There are many great questions, so I'm sure you will answer later. To pick one, here uh, in this work and in this presentation, you focus on the long uh, sequences, but uh, how might navigation in such rabbit hole sessions compare to different navigation paths and different navigation strategies that one might see either in uh, games and the artificial scenarios or in uh, real um, uh, navigation in the wild. So uh, this, is, uh, this work is a follow-up of mm -hmm. another paper where we um, investigated more broadly uh, the navigation. And um, we also uh, compare with um, um, the session generated by games. And there is a, the, an important difference that is uh, in, uh, in games, uh, um, there is a clear definition of success. So you know exactly where the user uh, was going. And uh, uh, so you explore how the user navigate uh, this network to find exactly uh, what is the goal. In natural uh, navigation is, uh, is very different. Uh, uh, you don't see this kind of uh, going uh, to a hub, meaning a page uh, that is generic uh, because um, you are uh, going to a central node to uh, find that the destination page, but is uh, in, uh, in average uh, a lot shorter. Um, people attend, uh, for example, 78% uh, 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 of the sessions are composed by a single page load. So it's a fact check and then a tele Wikipedia. And then uh, the exploration is different, it's not, um, it, it, they tend to go to the periphery of the network. So they enter in very popular pages from a search and then they diverge to a periphery. And then many other uh, differences, but uh, mm -hmm. there is a full paper uh, about that. 
Awesome. Thank you, Tiziano. We'll move on to the next presentation by Nicole Schwitter. And the title of the talk is Offline Meetups of German Wikipedians Boosting or Breaking Activity. Thanks a lot for the introduction and the nice presentation before. Um, so I will dive right in. What I'm presenting today is a part of my PhD thesis that is still a work in progress. And in my PhD, I research, well, Wikipedia, and I particularly focus on the people behind it, on the people that collaborate together to write this online encyclopedia. Now, I'm less focused on the online component, but I focus more on the other side, the offline side. So whenever people, whenever Wikipedians go out in the real world and put on their nice t-shirts and meet and face to face, to get a face behind the username. Those informal meetups can come in all shapes and sizes from the from drinking, meeting up in a pub and drinking a beer together or going on a hiking trips or organize barbecues or also be more work related in the terms of like open editing events. So those offline meetups are what, what I'm interested in in my PhD and I'm looking at how offline meetups influence online behavior and today I'm focusing on one specific domain of online behavior. So I'm looking at how offline meetups influence online contributing behavior, so editing on Wikipedia. To answer the question, I look at the German Wikipedia from 2001 up to 2020. And on one hand, I have contributing behavior that I take from the data dumps where I look at the metadata. So I know who edited what, when, and I look at meeting data. Now, meeting data is less is not process generated, so it comes less structured, but it's still available because meetings are organized on the platform. So my goal was to scrape all organizational pages. Um, those pages kind of look like the screenshot on the right. Um, so you have a list of attendees and list of apologies and also minutes recorded. So my goal was to scrape all um, meetups organized on the German Wikipedia in that time frame. I ended up with over 4,400 meetings that took place in that time frame. Most of them, well, 99% taking being organized in the German speaking area, but 1% did um, take part globally in 20 different countries. So far to the descriptives. Now my question for today was is to identify the cause and effects of meetings. So I'm interested in whether those attendees with their t-shirts edit any different than um, a comparable group that did not take part in meetings. So what I want to do is I want to compare the, the on the right, the meetup attendees, the treatment group to a control group of non-attendees. So for each of my attendees, I selected one similar twin, similarity being defined as being similar in tenure and past activity, and then I can compare them. So my control group on the left and my treatment group on the right are similar up to the point of the meetup. And now I want to compare their behavior after the meetup. So I have a quasi-experimental setup and I can use a difference in differences design. So that means that I want to compare the changes before and after the meetup um, across the actual attendees, the treatment group, and the corresponding um, twins, the control group. In this presentation, I look at the long-term change. So I look at one year before the meetup versus one year after the meetup. In the paper, I also look at shorter-term changes. And I break the process into two separate parts. So first, I look at meetup at, I look at users which have not made an edit in the year before the meetup and then look at, did they make an edit after the meetup, yes or no? And I look at users which have made an edit in the year before the meetup and look at the change in the number of edits. So I have either did people that not edit before edit after the meetup, and if yes, to what extent did they um, change their editing behavior? Um, so now on the left, um, I look at this binary decision, so people did not edit before, and now the intercept is the baseline probability, and what we find, what I find, is that 6% of people that did not make an edit in the year before 
um, do make an edit in the year after. So there's a 6% probability to start editing in the year after if you didn't edit before. However, if you're in the treatment group, meaning you actually attended a meetup, um, your probability is 25% higher. So if you actually attended a meetup, your likelihood to start editing is at 31%. If we look at the extent, we find a negative intercept. Um, what that means is that people make on average 12 edits less in the year after than in the year before a meetup, at least if they are in the control group. If they are in the treatment group, meaning they actually did attend this meetup, they only make about four edits less. So there's a negative trend, but it's much less pronounced in the treatment group than in the control group. So to summarize, what I find is that meetups have a positive effect on Wikipedia. Um, users that do attend the meetup are much more likely to start contributing again after the meetup if they have not been editing articles before. And while it is not the case that users increase their contributions after a meetup in comparison to before the meetup, the reduction in contribution is less than a reduction in a comparable control group. And if you want more details um, about methods and more detailed analysis and directions for future research, please also look at the paper and come to the poster session. That's it. And I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole, for the good presentation. Um, one question is, um, how did you Oh, oops, I missed it. Um, do you also have any data outside of the German Wikipedia? And then uh, also thinking about uh, next steps uh, in your research, uh, what are the next steps that you're planning to do? And also if you can um, also do active experiments and do some community campaigns, uh, what would be ideal experiments that you could envision? Thank you, so many questions. Um, to start with the first one about language versions, I'm only, seeing, only focusing on the German one. Um, scraping all meetups did take me about one year. So um, there's just, there are many meetups and many pages to read. So it just does take a lot of time, um, especially going to larger language versions. I did look at the uh, Alemannic Wikipedia as well, but I didn't really analyze it and used it mostly as a toy example. Um, I did forget the other questions. One was about- it was just about the next steps. <laughs> our next steps. Um, so yeah, in my PhD in general, I'm also looking at how online behavior about offline meetups influencing um, elections and norm, so reverts. And so I'm currently working on that. Okay, thank you. There are a lot of questions. I'm sure you'll have there, time. There are several questions for you, Nicole, which I'm sure uh, people will ask you in your uh, in your poster session. Uh, thanks, uh, Christina. We'll move on to the third and the final full talk uh, in this session. And the title of the paper is The Role of Online Attention in the Supply of Disinformation in Wikipedia. And the authors are Anas Eleviari and Giovanni Luca Giampaglia. So over to you, Anas. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you, we can see you. Okay, awesome. So my name is Anis and I'm a PhD student at the University of South Florida. And today I'm presenting our paper on online attention and disinformation in Wikipedia. I have worked on this research alongside my supervisor, Dr. Giovanni Champag. So um, there exist many potential threats to Wikipedia's knowledge integrity. One of these threats is the creation of hoax articles, which are fake or fictitious entries that were deliberately created. For example, this is a hoax article that was created about a fake Australian god and lasted around 10 years without getting caught. Vandalism is another common threat to Wikipedia's knowledge integrity. However, hoaxes are different from vandalism in the sense that vandalism defaces existing articles, while Wikipedia, while hoaxes are completely new um, entries. Vandalism attacks can take the form of textual insults, humor, page planking, as shown by this example. In a research conducted by Dr. Kumar and colleagues, amongst them is Dr. Robert West, 
um, they showed that 92% of hoaxes get detected within the first day, with one in 100 hoaxes survive for more than a year. So people's behavior online is influenced by both endogenous and exogenous factors. And these factors in turn shape how we produce and consume information on the web. And in a study conducted previously by Dr. Champalia and uh, colleagues, they studied the creation of non-hoax articles on Wikipedia. And they showed that there is a sudden spike of attention right after the creation of Hurricane Sandy entry on Wikipedia, which means there was a need, there was a demand for an article to be created about that uh, topic. They then went on to show that the demand drives the supply of information for non-hoax articles. And um, the unresolved question is what drives the creation of hoaxes on Wikipedia? And to get a step closer into answering that question, we try to see whether online attention in the form of traffic to Wikipedia toward a topic increase the likelihood of disinformation in the form of hoax articles being created about it. And to do so, we've collected a set of known hoaxes, which is 190 hoax articles that are kept within a page maintained by Wikipedia moderators. And these hoaxes are successful in the sense that they evaded detection for more than one month or discussed by media sources. This plot shows how many hoaxes were created for each year. And as we can see, between 2005, 2007, um, that's where the majority of hoaxes were created in that set. And that, um, and that is parallel with Wikipedia's known peak of activity during that time. And in 2008, we see a decline. And that's because the MPP process, Wikipedia's patrolling process, started in November 2007. And um, we've mentioned the word topic before. A topic in our research, we define it as the non-hoax non outlinks, which is the pages that are linked within a hoax article. And we are studying the traffic for that topic 14 days and over a 14 day observation window centered around creation days. So seven days before creation and seven days after creation. And for each hoax, we calculate the relative volume change, which is delta V over B with V of B representing the topic's median traffic seven days before, and V of A representing uh, seven days after for the topic's median traffic. And if that value is positive, if the, the, the relative volume change is positive, that means that the hoax accumulates more attention before creation than after. However, to affirm that claim that it is not unique to hoaxes, we have to establish a baseline to compare our relative volume to. And we collect what we call a cohort. And a cohort is defined as all the non-hoax articles that were created on the same day as each hoax. So we have 190 hoaxes, 190 cohort for each hoax. And uh, this cohort was collected after resolving redirects. And this plot shows that the inclusion of redirects not only inflates the cohort size, but also can skew the, the traffic analysis that we do, which is getting the values of delta V over B. And um, inspired by the work of Dr. Kumar and colleagues, we studied the appearance features to understand how hoaxes differ from cohorts. We're not going to get into detail about all of the appearance features, but we're going to point out one feature, which is uh, the wiki link density represents by how many, um, how many outlinks exist within a page per 100 words. This graph simply shows the z-scores of that appearance feature. If the z-score is positive, that means that the hoax article tends to tends to have more density than um, the cohort. And if the z-score is negative, it's the opposite. And uh, we can see in this graph that it's nicely centered around a zero, which means that um, we can eliminate any confounding factors that can exist from our analysis due to different linking patterns, such that hoaxes and cohorts have similar linking patterns. So that's why it's um, an apples to apples um, kind of situation when we compare hoaxes to cohorts. And um, this graph shows just a sample distribution of delta V over V for one hoax. The turquoise bars shows the, the, the distribution of the delta V over V for the cohort. And um, the red line shows the delta V over V for the hoax. And the, the black dashed lines shows the average for the turquoise distribution. And um, if the value of the hoax, if the red line is to the right of the, of the black line, that means that the hoax compared to its cohort tends to accumulate attention before its creation than after. And to better understand if this applies to all of the hoax articles within our data set, we calculate the difference. The difference is simply the, the subtraction of these two lines. And if this difference is positive, that means it affirms the case that attention is accumulated before creation for the hoax. 
And um, this shows the distribution of the 190 D values that we got. And um, the mean in this case is positive, which means in most of the, of the, of the difference values, hoaxes tend to accumulate more attention before creation. And we constructed the 95% confidence interval using bootstrapping, and we can see the sample mean falls within the 95% confidence interval. And to conclude, um, hoaxes tend to have more traffic accumulated before their creation than after when compared to their cohorts. And this is consistent with a model in which the supply of false and misleading information is driven um, by attention. And probably the most important conclusion of all is do, do not create hoaxes. Like if, you, if, if there's only one point you get from this presentation is please do not create hoaxes. And uh, if you would like to replicate our plots or generate our data, this is the GitHub link. And uh, thank you all, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Anis, for the great presentation. Um, one question related to the selection on the media coverage. So mm -hmm. um, could the discussion by media sources introduce a bias? Because there might be some very short-lived hoaxes that get picked up by some media. So did you check the characteristics of uh, of the hoaxes and the, the duration of the coverage? Um, not, not individually, but all of these hoaxes are successful uh, in the sense that they were discussed. Not all of them are discussed, but some of them are discussed. But we didn't go individually into checking whether each one of these hoaxes are discussed by, um, by media sources. However, in, in our future consideration is to expand this to not only successful hoaxes, um, and um, in non-English Wikipedia entries as well. Thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Anes. Uh, now we move on to the lightning talks. This is the second round of those. And again, please uh, put your questions for these lightning talks uh, in the Google Doc. We won't have time to take questions immediately afterwards, but you'll use that during the poster session. So uh, Miriam, if you could please uh, start the Lightning talks, please. Hi, my name is Nidia Hernandez. I am responsible of data processing in Caicit Conicet, a research institution in Buenos Aires, Argentina. On this video, I will present the first steps of a study related to improving Wikipedia's references. Wikipedia allows to automatically generate citations from a URL using a citation generator. These automatic citations sometimes present errors, as you can see on the screen. Our research is part of web to sit a project that is developing a tool for improving the results of the citation generator for URLs. We want to evaluate the performance of the citation generator, comparing the citation that it produces for a URL with the correct form of the citation for that URL. To do this, First, we need to find a set of correct citations having URLs and extract the metadata from them. We also have to obtain automatic citations for the same URL and measure the difference between the correct and the automatic citation. For the first step, finding a set of correct citations, we gather the corpus of 10,000 featured articles from English, French, Portuguese and Spanish Wikipedias. We isolated all the citation templates from the wiki code, and we then extracted the information for a series of parameters, title, author, source, uh, date, and of course, URL. So if you're interested in our findings regarding these first steps, please take a look at our long abstract of the CITES conference. And if you want to know more about the script and the following steps, visit our Jupyter Notebook on pause and join us on the conversation of the Wiki Workshop. Thank you. In the last few years, major social media platforms like Twitter and Reddit have noted the phenomenon of ban evasion, a ban circumvention strategy that leads to temporarily disjoint operation of two accounts. To study online ban evasion, we have curated a dataset of about 8,500 ban evasion pairs in Wikipedia, where each pair comprises a banned malicious parent and a child that was created to evade the ban and continue malicious activities. 
We formulate the ban evasion life cycle and address crucial early prediction, detection, and attribution tasks using machine learning models. Our models demonstrate an impressive ability to predict and detect ban evasion. Additionally, our data-driven analysis shows that there are similarities between parent and child accounts in terms of edited pages and vocabulary used. Interestingly, some ban evaders tend to hide by using fewer swear words and more objective language than their banned parents. Based on our research, we are working on a tool that would help Wikipedia moderators in evaluating suspected ban evasion. Here's a demo of the tool by Zen and Geo. Let's say we have two users with quite different usernames. The model informs us that these two users are a ban evasion pair with a probability of 0.87. We want to understand why our model thinks that way. When we open the metadata dashboard, we can note that even though these two usernames don't seem similar, they are actually editing the same Wikipedia pages such as Paul Rose and Victor Davis. For a closer look, we analyze the most similar sentences added by these two accounts and notice that they both mention two people with the same last name who were born in the same location and were involved in rebellion groups. Our system also captures sentences that discuss burials and symmetries as similar. It also allows visualizations across other categories like vocabulary overlap, psycholinguistic attributes, and sentiment scores. Thank you, and please stop by our Wiki Workshop poster and full presentation in the main conference. Hello everyone, my name is Patrick Healy. I'm a PhD candidate at Sarat Labs at Monash University. Today I'll be presenting this early stage joint research project titled Editing the Truth. In this project, we want to understand how and why governments may be interfering in Wikipedia. In particular, we're looking at the capacity of states to disseminate information in Wikipedia. And we're using government edit quality, in particular, the ability of government entities to adhere to the strict editing standards of Wikipedia to create a new measure of bureaucratic professionalism in the digital space before looking at the determinants of government editing behavior on Wikipedia. We start by creating a data set of 46,000 edits from 702 government entities in 83 countries. We create this data set using a database called DBIP, which has ownership information for the universe of internet protocol addresses. We create a tool to query each owner in the Google Knowledge Panel and extract an entity description for that owner. We then create a training data set of entity descriptions using the Wikidata taxonomy and classify each owner in the DBIP database as government or not government. Using our government IP data set, we match this to anonymous Wikipedia edits in ORS compatible language versions of Wikipedia and use this vandalism detection tool ORS to measure the good intent of the government editor and whether or not the edit being made by the government entity damages the quality of the article. We find the percentage of high quality and low quality edits using this measure are a good measure of bureaucratic professionalism. In particular, that states with higher education, a greater proportion of female staff and higher cybersecurity skill make higher quality edits on average. We then map the geolocation of each Wikipedia article being edited by government. Here we see the map of government edits by United States government entities, and we use this to uncover the determinants of government edits. We look forward to discussing this with you more in the poster session. Hello everyone, nice to virtually meet you all. My name is Mikola and my colleague is Diego, and today I want to present our work, Wikifactline Semi-Automated Fact Checking based on Wikipedia. Even though the full automation of the fact checking remains unreachable today, any tool that can support the fact checkers with their manual work can be quite useful. In this work, we concentrate on search for fact checking. We experiment with different manual search strategies that true claim label and the article's quality influence on the fact checking. We use the fever data set and process that for our needs, leaving on the supports and refutes labeled samples. Also, we actualize their article names. We use the rate of found items, the rate of correctly placed item on the first position to evaluate our results. According to our experiment, the uh, searching for the raw claim in the Wikipedia search gives the good results, but the enhancement of the strategy by extracting the name entities and looking for them um, shows the great increase in the metrics. 
Another finding was that using the Google search and uh, the row claim as and query uh, gives the comparable good results. Another interesting discovery was that searching for sources to refute incorrect claims can be more complicated than looking for correct statement evidences. But the strategy with query modification uh, reduced that effect by searching for mentioned name entities instead of using the whole claim as a query. Also, we observed the article's quality um, got from WP10 model, and we found out that the distribution of articles of different quality differs on the different position in search. Also, we decided to build the initial pipeline for the ranking results to make the search more specific for fact checking using the quality information and um, learning to rank model that increased the recall one in our case. Thank you for your attention. Looking forward to answering all your questions and speaking with you and stand with Ukraine. Hi, I'm Nathan DeBlenheis, and I'm excited to be here at the Wiki Workshop to present my research investigating how to measure Wikipedia article quality in one dimension by extending ORs with ordinal regression. This is from work that I presented at OpenSim last year. Article quality measurement is an important uh, topic and thing to do for Wikipedia community members to track knowledge gaps, as well as for academic researchers to study important topics like political polarization and collaboration. Uh, now, Wikipedia has wiki projects. The wiki projects have members, and the members do quality assessments that are really valuable that allow us to study article quality in a really good way. However, their assessments are uh, limited in that they happen irregularly in time. Articles can change between assessments, uh, and this leads to missing data. As a result, uh, researchers have used machine learning to predict uh, that missing data, the quality levels of articles that haven't just been assessed. The second limitation of the assessments is that they happen on a discrete scale. This is probably actually a good thing from the perspective of the people doing the assessments, but for statistical purposes, it's a little bit complicated uh, because we might want to measure more granular levels of quality. Uh, Hathaker and others building on his work have dealt with that by basically combining the output of the ORS model into a single score because the ORS model out actually outputs uh, different scores for each quality level. Uh, and this process of combining the scores depends on assuming that the level that the different quality levels are roughly evenly spaced from each other. But I think that that assumption is doubtful uh, because it might take like a lot more work to raise a good article to a feature status than uh, to raise a stub to a start level. Um, and so in this project, I'm relaxing that assumption by using uh, ordinal regression model to combine the weights instead of just uh, taking their sum. And doing this provides an improved uh, level of accuracy um, on realistic research data sets. Uh, and we can also infer the um, different spacing between the quality levels. So this chart shows on the vertical lines, like for different data sets, uh, the quality levels that we would, the different quality levels. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you soon. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Kai Zhu. So today, I want to share with you our research in progress, Can Machine Translation Narrow Knowledge Gap Across Languages? So this is the very early stage work, so any of your comment, suggestion, and feedback uh, will be highly appreciated. So in this study, we want to investigate the role of machine translation in content production on Wikipedia and how it could help with the knowledge gap issue. So we leverage a niche experiment where Wikipedia integrate Google Translate into its in-house content translation tool in January 2019. So content translation is this tool developed by uh, Wikimedia Foundation to support its editor uh, create an initial translation draft of an uh, article from another language of uh, Wikipedia by translation. Right? So from January 2019, you can use Google Translate to translate articles. So we have a uh, set of research questions that we aim to answer. We don't have the answer for all of them yet, but this is kind of the goal. Okay, so the first question is about information exchange between different language editions of Wikipedia. The second question is about how uh, the behavior of editor will change the the way and the way they collaborate with machine translation algorithm. The third is about the diffusion of locally relevant and culture specific content. To have some preliminary results, first of all, 
uh, we just see such clear trend after the integration of Google Translate in 2019. So there's a steady increase in number of article created with content translation. Okay, so that's all the time I have. If you're interested, please reach out. Hey everyone, I'm Mar Miguel. I will give you an overview of this paper called Wikipedia Older or Teen, co-authored with Christian Consoni and David Laniato. Wikipedia is an undeniably successful project with an unprecedented number of online volunteers. However, researchers observed that the number of activators for the largest Wikipedia language editions started to decline in 2007. Years after those announcements, researchers and community activists still need to understand community growth. In this study, we inspected the temporal evolution of the number of activators, comparing the trends obtained for different language editions and performing clustering to identify in general patterns. We focused on the 50 largest language communities in number of activators in August 2021. To group communities exhibiting similar temporal patterns, we applied k-means clustering to the time series, and we use dynamic time warping to measure a similarity between the temporal sequences. We obtain these six clusters. Our results suggest that only half of them exhibit a pattern of decline and or explanation, while the others are still growing in the size of their editor community. This represents a significant breakthrough given that it was widely assumed that communities were all in decline for not being able to maintain their number of activators, possibly because of a focus uh, on English Wikipedia on other language, large language editions. Uh, to talk more about this topic, uh, we'll see us in the Wiki Workshop. Thank you very much. This paper, The Digital Gender Disparity, is part of a larger Wikimedia research project titled Mapping Repositories on Gender and Sexuality in Indian Languages at CIS A2K. This research rise in continuum with earlier research done in the last decade at CIS A2K on gender gap in Wikimedia research projects. The gender gap and bias as noted in the existing scholarship lies in two forms. One is the participation gap and the editor composition, the second one being the nature of the content. This research focuses on the nature of the content that is produced on gender, sexuality and feminism in Indian languages. Thereby, this research lies in three major themes, knowledge production on gender and sexuality, digital documentation of existing knowledge and Indian languages. To understand the process of knowledge and content creation on gender, sexuality and feminism, through this research we have interacted with major stakeholders in the realm such as writers, translators, educators, artists, producing content within the capacity of individuals and organizations. Two major observations that have been made in this research are going to be presented here. We have learned from our respondents that the digital space is no less to the actual world. Socio-political ramifications that exist in the actual world are also reproduced in the digital space that hinder the process of knowledge production on gender, sexuality and feminism, which also leads to the lack of digital documentation of the existing knowledge on gender, sexuality and feminism. We have also learned that social media has evolved as a space for creation of knowledge and content and its dissemination, especially by individuals hailing from socio-economically marginalized sections. The second finding of this research was the importance of locating a critic. We have learned from all our respondents that the knowledge that they produce is very critical of how gender operates and they have been very consciously deploying an intersectional perspective while they are producing knowledge on gender, sexuality and feminism. Specific examples to this, as pointed out by our respondents, is the difficulty in translating conceptual vocabulary on gender and sexuality in Indian languages. The overemphasis of framing the feminist critique from the Western or the Anglo-centric perspective. It is also pointed out to us from our respondents that the Wikimedia projects should also include these critiques and work with a similar intersectional approach while they are producing knowledge and content on gender, sexuality and feminism. Thank you. This work is called Wikipedia and Gender, 
the deleted, the market, and the unpolluted biographies, created by Professor Nuria Ferran Ferrer, Professor Julio Meneses, and me, David Ramirez Ordonez. The gender bias in Wikipedia presents as a problem of three different kinds, editors, content, and readership. We focus on the gender content bias, specifically in the content creation and deletion process. We are working on English Wikipedia on biographies of scientists. The deleted, the market, and the unpolluted biographies. In this diagram, you can see different types of biographies after the evaluation process made by editors, creating a spectrum, starting from the deleted biographies, those marked for lacking notability or reliable sources, and biographies without any mark or unpolluted biographies. We propose this methodology for the analysis of two corpus of data, biographies in the articles for deletion category and biographies tagged to include reliable sources. In this way, we can cover in invisible biographies for those who are not administrators. We consider that in order to solve the gender bias within Wikipedia, we need to understand the logic of the evaluation of biographies regardless of the number of biographies created. If we don't take this into account, despite that more articles are created, the rate of deletion or tagging may still maintain the imbalance and the gap will continue to persist. Thanks for your attention. Please get in touch with us. Hello everyone, my name is Oktay Hassanzadeh. The work I'm presenting today is done as a part of a project at IBM Research with the goal of building an AI agent that could help with preparing for the future and helping the world plan for the so-called known unknowns. For the work we're presenting at this workshop, what we are exploring is whether we are able to build an event analysis and forecasting solution using the knowledge expressed in text and Wikipedia articles about past events and their consequences. I have a very simple example here to show the high-level idea. If we go back to January 8, 2020, we may be able to map the initial news articles covering the World Health Organization's announcement on a pneumonia outbreak with a known cause to relevant knowledge in Wikipedia, for example, the knowledge that SARS outbreak had similar events at the start, then we can look also for what SARS outbreak resulted in, use that to predict some of the consequences of the new outbreak. For example, the effect on tourism industry and then oil and gas prices, which also happened for COVID. The question is, will we be able to do this faster than analysts and at a scale? Here's a high-level architecture of the solution we are building using Wikipedia and Wikidata and in part Wikinews. At the core, there is a causal knowledge graph of events curated from existing event-related knowledge from Wikidata and then augmented by knowledge extraction from Wikipedia articles. In this solution, monitoring ongoing news is done through mapping news headlines to event concepts in the knowledge graph, and the analysis of the events is done through looking at past similar events and their causes and consequences as captured in the knowledge graph. As you can see on this example, Wikidata already has knowledge around major events and relations such as has cause or has effect, but of course it's far from complete. At the same time, there are many relations expressed in text in Wikipedia, even the first par paragraph of the article, and what we do is automatically extracting such relations to augment the Wikidata-based knowledge graph. This is done primarily through a number of neural models for language understanding. If you come to our virtual session, I would love to go through some of the lessons learned so far and the work we can do with the Wiki community to address some of the challenges we have faced in this project. Good day, and uh, welcome at the presentation on considerations for a model on noun classes in Niger Congo B, also known as Banto languages in Wikidata. I am Maria Kate with the University of Cape Town, and this is joint work with Langa Komalo from the Sadilar and Zola Maslaza from the University of Pretoria. The broader context is about the paucity of Wikipedia pages in the languages spoken in Sub Saharan Africa. Abstract in Wikipedia might help speed it up in creating those pages, but it relies on Wikidata for lexicographic data, and it has very little of that for the NCV languages. The first key step is, is the noun class system, as it governs the rest of a sentence. So here is a summary table of those noun classes, and what kind of things can be found in each of those classes. For instance, class 1 in the singular pairs with 2 for its plural for humans, 
whereas other animals go in noun class 9 and 10, respectively. These noun classes affect the sentence construction. Consider, for instance, the adjective tall and the verb eats, uh, which remain the same for English, whatever entity it applies to. But for the NCB languages, there are concords that depend on the noun classes of the noun in order to complete the adjective and the verb, as we can we see here on the slide. And we set out to collect those requirements for a model, which are based on two premises, being linguistic soundness and bootstrapability to other other resource languages. So here's a sampling of those 14 requirements. First, it would be Meinhof system, like shown in the previous table, uh, that is key since it's the only one that satisfies those two premises. It also includes translation aspect and various optional features. The list of requirements in the abstract may be challenging to implement fully, but we are nonetheless trying to design a comprehensive model that is extensible. A first concrete action for Wikidata would be to use Minos system to cover the very basics, which then also aligns with existing natural language generation functions. Any feedback on the requirements is welcome. Thank you for your attention. Awesome. Uh, definitely the most musical workshop that you're ever going to attend. Thanks so much to all the presenters. Uh, I know that the, that was a lot of lightning talks, but you'll get a chance to talk to each of these authors, each of these presenters during the poster talk. But before that, we have an eight minute uh, break. And uh, I believe uh, during this time, get your coffees and then we'll come back for the poster session. Uh, if you can stop the recording, Emily, that would be great.